Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, my name is Rhys Thomas. I'm the Managing Director of WTT Group of Companies. I'm joined this afternoon with Tom Wallace, who is with us, who's our Head of Tax. Um, say hello, Tom. Afternoon. So a couple of um, housekeeping points before we get going on this. Um, on the right hand side of your screen, for those who haven't used these um, software tools before, you'll see a section for questions to be asked. Please feel free to ask any questions you have throughout the webinar. We'll be very happy to answer them. We try and get to all of them where we can. Um, we would try to discourage kind of t personal tax questions um, saved for after the call, but we will uh, try and help out as, as best we can on everything. We appreciate there's a lot of questions as a result of the loan charge review, um, and you'll find that all of those questions can be asked and answered in the box to the right. Um, this is a public webinar which is being recorded. It's not solely for our clients, and therefore any client-related um, questions will be kind of refrain from answering obviously this is more the general approach to the loan charge review we've already had our loan charge review webinar for clients and this will be a follow-on from that so feel free to ask any questions and we'll we'll kind of shoot through the webinar as quickly as we can we will appreciate not to take up your uh, full lunch break so who are WTT for those who don't know us um, we are a group of tax advisors, legal experts and wealth professionals working together to give advice to our clients who range um, from all sorts of people, contractors, entrepreneurs, companies, individuals, um, anyone affected by HMRC. Um, there's a little bit about our kind of culture and ethos, if you want to have a read, uh, but we will crack on. So what we're discussing today is the outcome of the loan charge review eagerly awaited and um, interested to see what, what kind of came of it. We'll talk through the steps leading up to the loan charge review, the review itself and the recommendations made, the implementation and the draft legislation that accompanies it, um, what we think is perhaps lacking and as a result what the next steps are in the process um, and of course we'll be taking questions at the end. So. Starting off with the campaign to date and what's going on. As you can see from this, there's a short timeline on what's happened. Um, there has been a huge amount of involvement from the general public, affected taxpayers, the professional industry, large groups of um, uh, those affected, most importantly, the Loan Charge Action Group that has really spearheaded all of the work to date, supported by a number of um, key professionals in that. And of course, the Loan Charge APPG, which um, was instrumental in kind of forming and collating the MPs together. So how did that all come about? Um, well, I think lobbying pretty much began from day one. A lot of the professional types who could see the legislation for what it was um, really understood the potential detriment that it could cause and as a result began lobbying initiatives um, but perhaps the full expectation of it wasn't fully known perhaps um, by the general public until a little bit later uh, but the group started to form as soon as the detriment could be seen and from, from, from then on, um, the, the kind of process really kicked off with Stephen Lloyd tabling an early day motion in May 2008, which sought a wholesale removal of any retrospection from the loan charge. What we'll see as we carry on is that there has been some removal of retrospection, but retrospection is still very much reign supreme over the kind of the legislation itself and we need to discuss how changes can be made moving forward to to amend that so following the uh, early day motion that was tabled uh, the 
in December 2018, the Lord's Economic Affairs Finance Bill Subcommittee published a report on HMRC's powers. Uh, for those that have read that, they all will appreciate it was extensive and particularly damning on HMRC's conduct and how they operate, um, identifying a considerable number of areas where HMRC have fallen short in their intent and uh, need to collect tax in an appropriate way. Then on the 9th of January 2018, Sir Ed Davey uh, tabled uh, NC26, which wasn't loan charge specific, but was uh, what for for reasons kind of restricted in due process um, more, more notably, but it was intended to uh, indicate a review into the time limits afforded to HMRC for inquiry such that it would then look at the retrospective elements of the loan charge and its application. Uh, as a result, as a direct result, that the Treasury published a review uh, which was really needed but failed to be impartial to any degree. They, it, it came out and was published as a bit of a um, propaganda exercise identifying all of the reasons the loan charge was necessary in its current form didn't really do any major introspection as we wanted it to. And as a result, campaigning continued and, and developed and furthered over time. Um, and MPs started getting behind it in, in huge amounts. Ross Thompson tabled a debate on the 4th of April 2019, which was pretty much unanimous in its support from the MPs across the House. Um, and then all of this paraphrasing, of course, there are substantial activities that happened on individual basis, company basis, uh, group basis, all the while. But finally, on the 4th of September 2019, Boris Johnson announced a thoroughgoing review of the loan charge, which has led to the review conducted by Sir Amos Morse, uh, which we now uh, sit down and, and contemplate. So a lot has happened over a long period of time to get to this stage. That kind of shows us HMRC's willingness to defend this piece of legislation. Um, how far they're prepared to defend it is, is in question here, but it really does show the level of commitment and level of work that has been required for, the, for HMRC to, to kind of admit any level of um, error in the judgment of this legislation. So moving on, what were the recommendations themselves? So five major adopted recommendations and two, we think, significant rejected recommendations. The adopted ones, loans received pre 9th of December 2010 should be removed from the scope of the loan charge altogether. Clearly, that identifies considerable acknowledgement that retrospection is involved in the loan charge, not just retroaction. It's clear that that provision acknowledges that. We still remain concerned that any level of retrospection exists at all, and we'll go on to talk about that shortly. But ultimately now, the adopted recommendation number one is that loans pre received pre 9th of December 2010 are removed from the scope. So what does that mean for you or for those people who have, who have that? Clearly, as it reads, if you have loans that were issued or sent to you pre 9th of December 2010, there's no requirement to disclose those under the loan charge. There's no requirement to disclose them as part of your tax return for 1819, 1920 or 2021, which also we're going to talk about they are wiped from the loan charge exposure. The only risk, therefore, of a recovery from HMRC remains HMRC's second line of defence, which is the inquiry process. If you've received an inquiry in the past for loans relating to uh, pre-9 uh, pre of December 2010, then those are still within the scope of HMRC's remit to collect not through the loan charge, but through formal tribunal process and, and the closure notice process. So 
the, the recommendations remove one aspect of it, and certainly if you don't have inquiries pre-2010, then the expectation is that those loans are gone from contemplation with HMRC, but for uh, their, their intent to try and perhaps use extended timelines, which we'll come on to talk about shortly. But the basics of that mean that no loan charge, no loans received pre 9th of December 2010 will be exposed to the loan charge. And now only inquiries and discovery assessments received before that are within the scope of HMRC's gift to recover at this current present time. Tom, is there anything else you want to add into that? No, I, I don't think so. I, I think that the important point that Rhys uh, brings out there is that the loan charge being removed is, is one part of it where you've got open inquiries. Um, some people have read this into no taxes due full stop. What we will see is we'll see a renewed effort from HMRC to collect through the inquiry process. Um, part of the report did mention that they will set up a new team whose sole purpose will pretty much be to bring these inquiries to a closure. Um, and that will be something that will need to be defended through the tribunals in, in due course. But it is an important distinction to make there and, and people do need to understand that. So there's been a quick question. Um, what about APNs? Have these been paid in relation, uh, that have been paid in relation to loans pre-2010? Will these be repaid by HMRC? It's very important to separate out the inquiries, as Tom's just mentioned, the inquiries from the loan charge and put in place a position of saying, well, the loan charge is one side of things, the inquiries is another side of things. The APNs, condition A of the APNs, are that there needs to be an inquiry in progress for an APN to be issued. So it's very clear that the APNs relate to the inquiries side of things, not the loan charge. So the expectation is that if you have an inquiry, you have an inquiry, uh, if you have an APN, sorry, you also have an inquiry outstanding. Whether or not that inquiry is legitimately issued, executed in time, something that HMRC has, has had, um, it is yet to be debated, and we can talk about that in, in kind of more personal circumstances as to the, the effect of that. But the APN is very much related to the inquiries, not the loan charge. So the change in loan charge position and the removal of loans received pre 9th of December 2010 does not directly impact on APNs or the outstanding nature of those inquiries. So the only way that those APNs can be withdrawn, refunded, closed off, is if that inquiry is closed out and condition A remove, is removed from that uh, with the APN. So, the key is to say the inquiry is outstanding and therefore the APA, APN remains outstanding. Nothing to do with the loan charge or the review at this stage. I think really just to, to, to be really clear on this, that the report does not say that the schemes were legitimate tax planning prior to the 9th of December 2010 or worked or that no tax is due. It simply says that the loan charge will no longer apply to those years. Yeah. Um, is there a pre-2010 law that allows HMRC to now collect income tax on loans? Um, in short, no, there's not a law. Um, I think the intention is for HMRC, where they have an inquiry pre-9th pre of December 2010, to seek to collect on that through ongoing tribunal action and or issue enclosure notices to resolve them through settlement. Do that, yeah, I, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I speak to a lot of people uh, about the situation and, and I do hear a lot of people say to me, where does it say in legislation that loans are taxable? Uh, and clearly it doesn't. The whole point of the arrangements were to create a, a position where you receive something that fell outside of the tax code. What you then got to do is you then got to look at case law that's been through the courts and Parliament's intention. And the seminal case on this one is the one of Rangers Football Club, who used very similar arrangements to what a lot of contract to loan schemes look like. Um, and look at what the court said there when they took a purposeful interpretation of the arrangements. And what they said there is actually the payment from the employer to the third party, in that case, the trust, was actually a redirection of earnings. 
and therefore taxable under normal pay as you earn principles. So it's not so much you need to look for a specific piece of legislation, it's actually look at how the courts have interpreted the arrangements to date. Yep, great. Okay, um, hopefully that's clear in terms of the separation between the recommendation on the review and, and what's, what's happening there. Um, there's another question, what happens to IHT pre-2010? The inheritance tax position is um, confusing to say the least, and I think it's very clear that HMRC have a lot of uncertainty around it. Inheritance tax in principle arises when a loan received from a trust is released and therefore creates an exit event. Um, and so where HMRC are looking for settlement and saying, are you going to release the loan from a trust, does that create an exit event, which then forces IHT to fall due? Again, the IHT only hinges around the event, around the, uh, the settlement, which would be a settlement of inquiries, and therefore nothing within the loan charge review currently affects the inheritance tax position. Yeah, so it's, it's another situation we have to uncouple it from the loan charge because all of these things are easy to get confused and link them together, but they're actually not. IHT was irrelevant to the purpose of the loan charge. It's on the loss of value to the trust when the loan's released. Okay. Um, if you settle with HMRC, can you get your money back if litigation wins? Um, in short, the principle on that is no. Um, the situation is if you enter into a uh, extra-statutory contract with HMRC, which confirms that you want to pay them the money, um, that is a contract. So the only way that you could subsequently get that money back would be to breach the contract or identify a breach of contract in some, some way. Um, something to think on but um, that is the only way that that would be apparent. Now, what I would say is that clearly the changes to the loan charge as a result of the review, as we'll come on to, to say shortly, is that those who settled under voluntary restitution, so settlement by actual contract, have or are due to have their money refunded. So that to me says that changes to the loan charge review can actually have the propensity to affect extra statutory contracts um, and HMRC can therefore seek to legislate for that. So what, what I'm saying is right now under the current legislation that may not be the case if litigation wins but if substantial changes to the loan charge or substantial changes to HMRC's collection policies are changed then now as a result of this loan charge review we have some precedent to actually the rules changing extra statutory settlements which is pretty rare um, and so something to think about so it's a good question as I would say now no if you're settling you need to think of settling as full and final and trying to close everything off however we do we are starting to see creepage in terms of precedent saying that changes to the legislation or changes to HMRC policy can affect those contracts so something to definitely keep an eye on, I think. Um, okay, so moving on, the questions that we have remaining relate to point two, so we'll cover those shortly. Point two of the recommendations was that loans really re received on or after the 9th of December 2010 would be removed from the scope of the loan charge if the taxpayer has made reasonable disclosure and HMRC failed to act. So there's two bits we need to break down there. Previously to yesterday, we would have said there's some confusion over HMRC uh, because in their recommendations, they said full disclosure rather than reasonable disclosure as recommended by the report. Subsequently, draft legislation and guidance notes have come out yesterday and reasonable disclosure does seem to be put back into that. Um, so I'll pass over to Tom to kind of explain now, based on the legislation, what reasonable disclosure and the HMRC failed to act part um, means. So as much as Reese said, some confusion's cleared up 
um, I think with all of these things, um, they're not always clear. What we've got is legislation, uh, and the legislation is, is quite clear in what it considers to be reasonable disclosure. Um, you need to identify there was a loan, identify who the person the loan was made to, uh, identify the relevant arrangements in connection with the loan, uh, and it, the return needed to contain sufficient information for it to be apparent um, that someone looking at it could consider that there was a loan arrangement in place. So that's what the legislation, and then you look at the guidance notes, and the guidance note says, focus number or white space disclosure. Now, my immediate reaction is it says nothing in, in that piece of legislation about focus numbers, and being a tax professional and dealt with dealing with litigation um, on an ongoing basis, I always prefer the legislation to what is essentially just uh, a press release from HMRC of their view of something. So this is draft legislation. I would hope that perhaps this was reviewed, particularly when it goes through Parliament, and that was tightened up slightly. Um, but at the moment, that is what it, it says reasonable disclosure looks like. So reasonable disclosure is one side of the coin, and then HMRC has failed to act is the second side of the coin. Um, now clearly, failed, failure to act is failure to open up an inquiry or an investigation of some description, whether that be a discovery assessment or a Section 9A notice, a COP8. Some failure to act by HMRC needs to be identified. So the question asked here is reasonable disclosure on both closed and open years. The answer is reasonable disclosure which leads to HMRC acting, so which leads to HMRC opening up an inquiry. So you have to have both reasonable disclosure and no inquiry for this part to apply to you. If you've made reasonable disclosure, HMRC have seen that and subsequently opened up an inquiry, then the loans still remain within the scope of the legislation. If you've made a reasonable disclosure and haven't got an inquiry, then the loans don't come into this legislation. If you haven't made reasonable disclosure, but also haven't got an inquiry, it's determined that these loans still potentially come within this legislation. So those are the three outcomes um, on these, these positions. So hopefully that's clear. Um, that's answered that question. That's, uh, Uh, right, we've got one question. If loans have been released, is this a taxable event and so should be paid on your tax return as income? Um, well, I, th I think there's, there's, there's two issues there. There's, there's one, a loan release after the 6th of April 2016, uh, sorry, 2017, it is a specific taxable event inside Part 7A. Um, a loan release prior to that um, actually, let's look at what the courts say. The courts say that it's not a beneficial loan. Um, the Rangers case is, is very clear. It's taxable under Section 62 of the normal pay as you earn legislation uh, as employment income. Uh, therefore, it doesn't fall within the release of a beneficial loan um, code um, and therefore is not a specific taxable event. So it, it's very situation specific. If you've got a particular situation in mind, perhaps get in contact with us. We can talk you through it yeah. uh, a bit more clearly. That sounds like a more personal situation there. Um, but it, it very much depends on circumstances and the date of that loan release. And the nature of the IHT will also be dependent on the type of trust that's being used, whether a trust has been used, of course, uh, where that trust is based, those types of things. So those are the kind of nuanced positions that depend on quite a few things, which is clearly why HMRC put in a lot of their settlements, we don't have enough information to make a determination on the IHT anymore and reserve their right to charge it in the future, which is a little bit um, short-sighted of them, I think, but is the situation we're dealing with. So IHT remains a sticking point for HMRC and one that they really need to get to grips with. Um, we think in the short term, shortest term possible. Um, 
another question saying what is reasonable disclosure is this defined i think tom's just defined that in line with the legislation um so hopefully if you want to have a re-listen to the webinar that will give you all you need in terms of reasonable disclosure um, what if it was argued at the time that the loan or overdrawn capital account didn't need to be disclosed on the self-assessment tax return? Um, that's fine, and, and it's arguable at the time that the loan wasn't disclosable because it wasn't regarded as income necessarily. That's fine, I understand that. But what that doesn't mean is that reasonable disclosure has been made. The question is, has the reasonable disclosure been made? not was there any reason why the reasonable disclosure shouldn't have been made. So it's a very factual question, which is the case with pretty much all legislation as, as far as is possible, is that did this thing happen, not are there any reasons why this, didn't think, this thing didn't happen. Happy with that, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think what you've got to look at there is, is Essentially, it's a recognition from HMRC and the government that there were people who gave sufficient information that should have had inquiries, did not have inquiries, and therefore HMRC dropped the ball. And that is essentially why they are taking them out of the loan charge provisions. It's not a case of whether you should have disclosed or shouldn't have disclosed. It, it's just whether HMRC had enough information at the time that they should have used to take action. What if the accountant did not make the disclosure on the self-assessment for you? Um, you have a obligation to observe your own self-assessment. Um, there are instances where reliance can be useful, but reliance on completing a tax return cannot be placed on your accountant. You are responsible for it, which is why your accountant will always write to you before submitting and say, are you happy with everything? You need to confirm this, that, and the other. But, but again, remember, this is this this legislation and this guidance is not saying disclosure should have been made. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's just saying that where it has been made, then potentially that can take you outside the scope of the yeah, charge. Good point. Yeah. Okay. So that clarifies point two, and those are perhaps the two most um, poignant of the recommendations to be adopted, um, and perhaps need the, the greatest level of clarity. Um, but moving on to point three, the loan charge can be split over three years consecutively from 2018-19 to 2020-21. Again, that has been um, noted in the draft legislation more clearly as to the route to that, and there's a need for an election, etc. So I'll pass over to Tom again um, to kind of update on where we are as a result of yesterday's release. So uh, essentially what the legislation says is that money can be split equally one third into each year. So it, it's very clear you cannot have an uneven split across the three years. Uh, to be eligible for splitting across three years, you have to make an election. Uh, that election has to be made by the 1st of October 2020. Um, although it may be made at a later time if an officer of revenue and customs allows it. However, you cannot make an election if you have not submitted the loan charge information, which was due 30th of September uh, 2019. However, that has been extended that date as part of this draft legislation to actually 30th of September 2020. So for those who have not submitted loan charge information uh, to HMRC, and are required to, they still have time to do that. Uh, the other key point is an election cannot be revoked. Once you've made the election, um, then it will remain in force uh, for those three years. So that's how it applies. I think in practicality, um, it offers little relief to people who are the most affected by this. Clearly, an unexpected tax charge relating to 10 years worth of tax being able to spread over three with your current salary on top is, as I say, little relief. Um, it is a provision, it is a concession to build on, but it is limited in its application, we think. Clearly, it does give people an opportunity to um, plan a little bit more effectively over that period of time with things like pension contributions, but it is limited in its application. Um, Tom, could you 
clarify the term election. Uh, an election is, is simply that. It, it's a notification to HMRC that you intend to take advantage of that provision. Um, it doesn't particularly have to be on a, a special form. Sometimes forms will be made available, um, but it's essentially um, puts the onus on you to tell HMRC you intend to use that provision. Um, the the way that will be um, to be conducted will probably be defined by HMRC in guidance notes in due course. Yeah. By the way, um, provisions for pension contributions has been asked about. Um, the, the, what I mean by provisions for pension contributions is that if you make pension contributions as a result of your loan charge liability, then clearly the effect in some instances of a of a um, correct pension contribution can reduce your uh, your your rating your tax bands down and give you more of the 20% band to utilize so there's a bit of a planning point there in terms of using pension contributions uh, effectively to um, limit your tax exposure uh, okay two more questions um, HMRC have told me that a year is categorically closed. Does that by definition mean there is no open inquiry? Uh, yes, in principle, absolutely. The terms under which they've told you it's closed um, and whether or not it has been closed is remains to be seen. Um, but a closure is something that is being kind of used quite cleverly by HMRC to mean perhaps different things. And this dates back to Jesse Norman's commitment on the loan charge that where an inquiry had been opened and the taxpayer had fully disclosed their participation and everything through that inquiry process and the inquiry had subsequently been closed, um, then they wouldn't be affected by the loan charge. That is different to a closed year which is one where HMRC have never necessarily opened an inquiry in the first place. So for the purposes of HMRC, it's better to use unprotected and closed. An unprotected would be one which HMRC has never issued an inquiry or a discovery assessment on. And what oh, the, the, the phrase closed means that it's previously been opened and subsequently been closed. There is a need to, to create those kind of semantics around the wording, just to clarify, just kind of navigate your way through HMRC's language. But in reality, if that year is closed or unprotected, that means there is no open inquiry. Yes, currently no open inquiry. Um, if your loan charge is split over the three years, is Oh, sorry, if your LC tax bit over the three years is much less than your settlement loan charge tax bill, do you have to pay the difference? Uh, I, this comes back to whether you've got protected or unprotected years. Paying the loan charge does not close out the inquiries. Um, so should you be in a situation where your loan charge bill is £40,000, but your settlement on five years worth of open inquiries is uh, £100,000, then yes, the revenue are going to close those inquiries at some point, tell you how much they believe to be due and offset your loan charge against that to charge the difference. What is the reasonable disclosure position for company directors whose schemes slash loans were disclosed on company accounts, resulting in an inquiry on the company, but not disclosed on personal tax returns with no personal inquiry opened? The, the, the legislation is very clear that it's talking about returns under Section 8, uh, TMA 70, which is personal returns. Um, there is case law that says it's not for the revenue to look at all different sources of returns when they're looking at whether it's an accurate one or not. They simply look at the information you provide on your personal tax return. So I think in that situation, you would not be covered by the terms in the legislation. Okay, um, what if I declared the loan charge on my self-assessment but not the DOTAS number and I have no had no inquiry? 
Well, I, I think, just, I, again, these are quite specifics here, but if you had a DOTUS number and have not put it on your tax return, then by the wording of the extended time limit assessments, HMRC have 20 years to issue an assessment on that because that's considered to be a deliberate um, concealment of a, a position. So you have to be a little bit careful there. That's very different to not having a DOTUS number or never been given, the scheme's never been given a DOTUS number, but uh, these are quite nuanced positions um, that probably need a little bit of personal guidance. Okay. Um, the fourth uh, recommendation which has been adopted is refunds made for those who settled by voluntary restitution are not and no longer within the scope of the loan charge. So touching on this we discussed earlier, this is a very clear acceptance by HMRC that um, the there is retrospection in its most raw form as part of the loan charge. Perhaps the most obvious of that is where the year is unprotected, but it allows HMRC to ignore relevant time limits on inquiry opening and still tax through the loan charge. Um, that is perhaps the most, the biggest offence to retrospection in here. And clearly there has been some attempt to remove that by removing years pre-2010, obviously removes those which uh, are not, um, th which don't have inquiries because the tax is no longer due. It also acknowledges that people who were settling by voluntary restitution were doing so for the sole purpose of threat of the loan charge. Um, the, 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 the literature that come out, came out from HMRC was to say um, you either settle your voluntary restitution, which voluntary restitution for those that don't know is that years which are unprotected by HMRC but they ask taxpayers to make a voluntary decision to pay the tax that is not yet proven to be due. Um, that's technically the same with all settlements. Uh, and that that voluntary restitution was only being paid for two reasons. A, because in some instances, HMRC wouldn't let people settle unless voluntary, re voluntary restitution was observed. And the second position that because, because of the loan charge being applicable, the the loans taxed onto your current year earnings would have been so much more um, damaging to you that you had no option but to settle. So clearly people who settled by voluntary restitution were determined to be settling by force by Sir Amos Morse and as a result the recommendation was that those with voluntary who have settled with voluntary restitution and that their loans are no longer within the scope of the loan charge as a result of points one and two above will be given a refund of that money. Um, I would say that's rare, very, very rare and very positive, very, very positive in terms of movement forward and changes to be made. It's a good acknowledgement of retrospection. Um, it's a door that we must now push hard to open further, absolutely. Um, in terms of the practicalities of, of obtaining those refunds, uh, that hasn't been yet legislated for in the draft legislation or indeed in the guidance notes. HMRC will say that you can make an application for the refund in the summer once the legislation has been um, has reached royal assent. So we await further instruction on how to claim those refunds um, because that's going to be a, a huge and important thing to do um, and we will clearly probably be having a webinar on that in due course when that comes out. Um, right, some questions there. I'm paying instalments to cover my voluntary restitution amount. Due to feature reset fund, can I stop instalments? Advice from HMRC is not clear. Um, as you'll appreciate on on webinars like this, we have to give guidance which is strictly within the interpretation of the legislation, the law and everything. And the risk of stopping your instalments now results in potential debt, debt recovery action against you by HMRC. 
that's for a number of reasons, but most notably because HMRC aren't particularly joined up on this just yet. However, until that legislation is in legislation, it is just a recommendation. And therefore, if you stop making your payments, then it, the debt management and banking can come and seek full recovery from you. And this draft legislation may not reach royal assent. So the advice on that is, rather painfully, really painfully for me to say, is to keep making those instalment payments until such a time that the legislation is, um, is reaches royal assent and is put into actual legislation. Then and only then do you get clarity as to whether or not this is actually being adopted in its current form. Then you can apply for the refund at that stage once HMRC advise on it. So in the interim, there's a really, really awful period where people still have to keep paying their instalments to settle but know that they're going to get a refund and know that they shouldn't be paying them but in line with avoiding debt management and banking action and recovery action against you the guidance has to be that you should continue making those instalments tom yeah it, it's a ridiculous position um but this whole situation in in to some extent has created many ridiculous positions um, as Rhys says, the, the revenue as a joined up department, particularly um, debt management and banking, um, is not something that they are or should be particularly proud of. And it causes us much difficulty. Um, and I would suggest that you will create much more problems for yourself should you stop payment. Yeah. Um, other than waiting what probably will be a period of about three months before we, we know what that refund, uh, refund policy looks like. Uh, if HMRC opened an assessment on one year, sorry, uh, but not the following year, where both years had the same white space declaration of the same loan amount arrangements but with different figures, could this be classified as reasonable disclosure? Well, I don't think it's particularly relevant whether it's been put on for, for two years. I think what that disclosure looks like is more the key. So yeah. I, I simply wouldn't be able to answer that question from that information. Yeah. Feel free to send over the uh, disclosure though and we can have a look at it and give you some more targeted guidance on that. Um, are voluntary restitutions available now to taxpayers? You can make voluntary restitution anytime you, you like. The, yeah. the, the key is the word voluntary. However, whether you um, would benefit from it in terms of having a cheaper outcome than letting the loan charge hit you will be very fact dependent. So again, if that is something that you, you think may be beneficial to you, please get in contact and, and we can run some numbers and, and see what that looks like for you. I paid on account and have unprotected and protected years. How will HMRC know what money to return? Um, this is not in relation to payments on account. This is in relation only to settlement. So this is looking at have you settled, you have unprotected years, and therefore the money can be repaid. The expectation is that you'll need to make an application to HMRC for that money to be repaid. But in short, HMRC will know what money to refund because the only difference is protected and unprotected. And therefore, HMRC know that, obviously, which is which years are protected and unprotected. So it would just be a, a simple um, situation between deciding those two, two things. What is the current target date for Royal Ascent? Uh, I, I mean, uh, it will form part of the Finance Act for the budget, which is on March the 11th. Um, I suspect we will get Royal Ascent um, probably beginning of April, um, possibly mid-April. Um, but that will depend on Parliament's timetable more than anything. Uh, with Brexit and what else going on, uh, that will be at a premium. Yeah. HMRC has said they won't make people bankrupt, but in reality, it's the liquidator who does that. So what does this mean for people who can't afford to pay? Um, we are not insolvency practitioners, first of all, but there are two different bankruptcy procedures for companies and for individuals. Um, and for the individuals, HMR, we, HMRC will proceed to make an application to the court for bankruptcy 
on an individual basis. So that's how HMRC intend to do it. They have to have a crystallized liability to determine that. But once a liability is not paid and they don't envisage it being paid, then they would make an application to the bankruptcy court for that process. Again, it's this disconnect between statements and legislation. Uh, and there's no legislation that says HMRC cannot or won't make you bankrupt. Um, now, you'd hope they would rely on it. Um, but I think history tells us that a number of statements have been made in, in various different time periods which no longer hold good. So I, I would say if it is something that does affect you, please have an early conversation with an insolvency practitioner um, mm. because they do have a lot of experience and, and practical experience of the situation and will be able to help. Yeah. Okay. Um, no more questions on that. Oh, there is one. Sorry. How do I get my account money back pre-2010 for voluntary years as I've not settled? Um, your money is held on account um, which you've paid and you can, you can request that money to be repaid for you once it's on account. However, HMRC determined that where you have an inquiry outstanding, you can't um, get that money that's held on account back. So as long as you have open inquiries, that money can't come back to you. But in terms of payment on account, that payment on account can be attributed to any aspect of your tax. So you're not paying money on account for closed years or for X year or for 2010-11. With that in mind, that can be used for any aspect of your tax. So if you're filing a tax return by the 31st of January, then in theory that is not protected and HMRC can allocate that to your um, your income tax liability for 2018-19. But, but let's remember here what we said at the beginning that, that the loan charge amendments does not mean that tax isn't due through the normal inquiry process for those periods and the fact that you've got a payment on account for those periods suggests you do have an open inquiry. So uh, the amendments do not automatically lead to a position where that payment on account should be refunded. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, um, the final recommendation was deferring the, well, it wasn't a recommendation, it was a response by HMRC, which is an acknowledgement that the, um, the information is not necessarily known and therefore they've allowed people to defer the loan charge disclosure for the self-assessment tax return on 2018-19 until the end of September 2020. So not your usual deadline of the 31st of January, instead it's deferral to end of September this year. Um, the effect of that is to give people more time to understand the position, to see draft legislation, to see full legislation, and to, to further the guidance and make the disclosures as applicable further down the line um, where they believe the loans are subject to the loan charge legislation. So it just gives you more time to understand your requirements for reporting, whether or not you need to report, whether you've got a loan that's susceptible to the legislation, what is going on basically. Um, other than that, don't really think it provides a practical benefit. Tom, would you say? No, I don't, I don't think so. I, I think um, what you've got is a situation uh, the revenue computer automatically scans and says what returns are outstanding at a certain date and fires out penalty notices. Big question marks how the revenue will stop that happening. If you look at the draft legislation, it's made provisions for interest not being charged um, if you file your return uh, at the 30th of September, um, as long as you go on and pay the liability um, for the loan charge. However, there's no similar provisions there for penalties, which sticks out like a sore thumb to me straight away. So again, we have revenue statements that do not necessarily correspond with what the legislation says. And from a, a tax professional's point of view, that is a troublesome situation to be in. And I therefore would be advising clients to err on the side of caution and at least file, file a provisional return by the 31st of January and then amend it for any loan charge uh, updates um, before 30th September. 
Yeah, so that's a, a, a it, it very clearly says in the legislation that, or in the recommendations that, the um, penalties and interest will be waived for loan charge related disclosures. That does not necessarily apply to your normal disclosures that you need to make um, by the 31st of January as normal. So that's one to be careful of, um, importantly. Okay, so a question, will interest be charged on the outstanding loan charge tax up to 2020 if you choose not to settle? Um, it, it, interest always is a function of something being due and payable and it not being paid on time. So if you've made a declaration for the loan charge uh, on your return, uh, that needs to be effectively, the due date should be 31st of January 2020. The uh, interest, as we've said in the legislation, is stopped. Uh, and as long as you pay it by January 2021, um, then no interest will be charged uh, for late payment. Um, but should you not pay it by that date, then yes, um, interest will uh, accrue. And my reading of the legislation is not just accrue, but also backdated to when it should have been paid, which is the 31st of January uh, 2020. Okay. That's all the questions on that point. So those are the recommendations as adopted by HMRC. There have been a number of recommendations that were made and observe observations that haven't met that. Perhaps the biggest observation was that uh, 6,000 people have continued to use loan schemes post the implementation of the loan charge, which for me clearly shows that the loan charge legislation has failed in its primary purpose. If it's failed in its primary purpose, we're struggling to understand what why it remains on the statute book. Um, there must be another way. And indeed, there is another consideration as to what is happening to protect taxpayers going forward. Are HMRC spending too much time looking retrospectively at trying to resolve the issues of the past with outstanding inquiries and lack thereof, rather than deterring people from using these schemes in the future. We'll come on and talk about that shortly, um, but that was an important point that was raised. The recommendations that were raised was a 10-year write-off for lowest earners. How that looked was that people earning less than £30,000 a year could pay um, over an extended period of time, and if it was determined that after 10 years of steady repayments, they still hadn't paid off their tax debt, then the rest of the debt would be written off. Um, you see these kind of things um, in, in different areas, but that was rejected and was perhaps a clear indication of the only recommendation used or put there to protect the lowest earners in the UK was rejected, which is disheartening and disappointing um, and something we should have been observed, as well as a number of professional advisors that we've spoken to um, since then, we think that that's one of the, the biggest disappointments um, in terms of the implementations. The other one was an annual update on inquiry. I'm sure there's plenty of people on the call who have got inquiries dating back to 2006, 7, 7, 8, with no activity to date on it, um, other than a few letters and a letter about the loan charge. Um, quite remarkably, the, the recommendation showed that HMRC or thought that they could stop issuing inquiries post the loan charge legislation coming into play um, as a result of reliance on the loan charge itself. All of this shows that HMRC's inquiry process is left wanting and an annual update on inquiry was recommended so that everyone heard every year that the inquiry is ongoing, the progress that had been made and it might encourage HMRC to close these things out a little bit quicker than they have done. Again, that was not accepted in that form. It was just said that HMRC's internal policies would be looked at and amended if necessary. Um, it does not legislate for HMRC to be forced to update on an inquiry on a yearly basis, which is disappointing for us. Um, but those were the, recommend, the rejected recommendations that I think people should be pushing to include. Um, they're important and they will help in terms of the administration of the tax system. So. We would like to see those put back in. So moving on, those are the recommendations. Um, sorry, 
Um, and moving on, what remains outstanding? That's really something we need to think about in terms of what is more to be done? What can go on next? Clearly, and something we've touched on a lot on this webinar already is the inheritance tax position. We know a lot of taxpayers who have refused to settle based on the uncertainty that the settlement offers. That's uncertainty around IHT, around the inquiry status, around voluntary restitution, around ticking a box which says you're a tax avoider, which is particularly offensive. Um, and that IHT position needs to desperately be clarified with HMRC. Um, part 7A, the determination for that 2010 date was that Part 7A of ITEPA was introduced, which they determined put beyond, reason, put beyond doubt that these schemes didn't work. We categorically do not agree with that position. Part 7A was determined by a, um, uh, I think it was a Treasury Select Committee of GET. Um, actually, no, it was a, it was a finance bill um, subcommittee that there was determined that parts, part 7A and that legislation was beyond the understanding of most business people to determine whether or not it applied to them. That cannot apply to contractors and people who are being advised to enter into these schemes that they knew that part 7A changed it. The reason for that is that part 7A was complex, misunderstood, and also related only to employment related situations. So what happened was the schemes transformed into self-employment arrangements in order to remain compliant, um, compliant in inverted commas there, but compliant nonetheless. And so it put it beyond the scope of part 7A and everything changed and it was business as normal. And many people on this call will appreciate that that is what happened and that's how they were advised and that's what went, went on. The, the, the position in terms of the review does not appreciate that. And that's something we really need to force home um, over the coming weeks, months, and years, is that this does not have a, an appreciation of what actually happened in the market. Part 7A was not a stake in the ground or a defining moment that meant that people knew that the schemes weren't working. It just wasn't. If anything is that, then it would be the Rangers case much, much, much later. Um, and if not, then the loan charge would be prospective from the date of its implementation because Part 7A, we don't think, has any relevance. So much more to be done there. Um, Part 7A, we believe, was not a stake in the ground and we need to observe that um, move forward. That includes, obviously, Schedule 12. There is not a relatable stake in the ground to Schedule 12, which looks at self-employment. Is the same as part 7a so again more needs to be done to understand why the self-employed schemes have been left exposed by the loan charge when everything pre-2010 hasn't um, we are loathed to include any retrospection at all in the legislation or in any facet of tax legislation we said four or five years ago that allowing this to happen would create retrospection in other areas of tax, which is a fundamental flaw in the tax administration system and generally the rule of law. We started seeing it creeping in. There was a case, CARTEF, recently where it was determined that HMRC needed an inspector to sign off on um, penalties. Uh, but HMRC have for the last 10 years allowed a computer to do so. It was held against HMRC and determined that an actual physical inspector needs to do it. A new piece or a new guidance piece has popped up saying that computers can issue penalties and that that legislation now has retrospective effect going back to 2010. Retrospection will be allowed to creep in to other areas of the tax system cannot be allowed to do so and that's what most MPs are behind, most professionals are behind removing any aspect of retrospection at all from this and that's what we will keep pressing for and I'm certain that other groups, other professionals will keep pressing for um, over the course of time. 
certainly in the near future. But those are the kind of things you need to go and see your MP about and speak to them about your experiences and those. Clauses in settlement remain hugely uncertain, um, especially around IHT, as mentioned. Um, looking at that point as saying, well, I'm a tax advisor and therefore I agree to settle everything. Those are both points that need clarification um, and we need some certainty. There are plenty of people who have, who would have settled and paid the tax, but for the way they've been treated by HMRC and the lack of certainty. The other point that needs clarifying is the existing nature of the loans, despite settlement and what happens on, upon release. Clearly, we see more and more um, loan companies calling in the loans and the effect that that brings on the situation is massively compounded. So we need to be conscious of that and we would expect HMRC to seek to protect taxpayers from those loan repayments in due course and put something in place which deals with the loan release position. And most importantly, as I mentioned earlier, there is just a serious lack on prevention of prospective schemes moving forward. The report has determined that 6,000 people entered into loan schemes post the loan charge legislation being implemented. Uh, it has failed and there needs to be something else that moves things forward and protects people moving forward. We once saw a letter from HMRC which was addressed to a taxpayer which said, you have recently entered into this scheme and for clarity, we regard this as a tax avoidance arrangement. That is exactly the kind of thing that HMRC should be doing to protect taxpayers. I met with the loan charge APPG yesterday and tried to kind of give that point across that more can be done with HMRC moving things forward. There's more that can be done in prospective alignment of protecting taxpayers. And that's another thing that we really should be focusing on. So in short, much, much more to be done. There is no intent to stop here. There is a foot in the door that we need to push open and we're very content that the review gives us a good opportunity to build on and continue and develop. Um, but we would urge people, even if you are out of the game and unaffected by these changes, uh, completely affected by these changes and you have no, no more involvement, just remember there are a, a, a lot more people who are affected by this and changes must continue to be made. Um, we will, of course, play a part in that moving forward. We're meeting with the relevant people as much as we can um, and we intend to keep moving things forward at pace where we're able to help and support both our clients and the wider market. So we're always welcome to, to, to we're always um, ready to chat with people talk people through their circumstances, even if you're not a client, it's absolutely fine. We're always open and ready to talk to people and always open and ready to meet with MPs and discuss what changes need to be made. So if you want to go and speak with your MP but you're not sure how to, just give us a call, we can talk you through it and we can kind of move things forward. But it is still very much worthwhile you talking to your MPs, still very much worthwhile you putting statement impact reports in showing that these changes don't go far enough that there's more that needs to be done. So, as I say, continued lobbying, see your MPs, very, very important. Um, it must, must continue. The great work that has gone on in the past is not finished, unfortunately. It's moved and some changes have been brilliant. Um, don't get me wrong, these changes, as much as the loan charge is unprecedented, the changes proposed are also unprecedented. So really well done to everyone involved. It, it is fantastic to see some concessions. As we say, just not enough. Let's keep going and keep lobbying, seeing your MPs. The APPG has been reformed and is moving at pace, which we're ecstatic with, the APPG on loan charge. Um, which is great news and MPs are combining across the house to further changes. As I say, I met with them yesterday um, and they very buoyed up to carry on and everything's moving forward. So really excited about where that's going. We want to see further changes to the draft legislation. We've seen the draft legislation that will go through a consultation phase now. So things need to, to happen in the immediate future. CLSO3 may be coming. We don't know where that is with HMRC. They may be offering some changes to the settlement. We shall await and see. 
outstanding loans need to be dealt with and we would encourage anyone who receives a demand from their trustee um, to seek some third party advice it goes without saying we can help there if if necessary if you get anything untoward just check in with someone and obviously ongoing tribunal action for those who have inquiries you need to be deciding whether you're settling or challenging those inquiries even in light of the loan charge review changes so those inquiries need dealing with consult with third parties there's plenty of people out there who are ready to talk to you about tribunal action challenging settling all the options us included so feel free to get in contact with people to discuss those those are what's next um, in terms of what's next for us we've got a schedule of webinars coming up we're intending to do some physical events in london for and around the uk where possible um, for contractors over the coming year so watch this space um, we will keep everyone updated through our newsletter our public newsletter that's available for all members this is being recorded and will be available on a youtube page as well so all of the information will be available there um, so unless there are any final questions um, which it, oh there is one is there an argument in challenging the 4.1 percent interest rate specifically made up for loan charge users i genuinely have no idea what that 4.1 percent yeah i relates think maybe to. i think that 4.1 percent perhaps relates to forward rate of interest on settlement is that right um uh, yes yeah that does right um in short um that forward rate of interest is not i don't believe made up for loan charge users no it, i mean time to pay it, provision in interest is allowed to be charged by legislation it's linked to the bank of england base rate uh, and then one percent is added for in hmrc's view the risk of a prolonged uh, time to pay arrangement being defaulted on um the short answer is it's been um a feature of settlements um that feature time to pay for as long as I can remember, um, and I was an inspector in the revenue for, or I was in the revenue for, for 19 years and inspector at various levels for 14 of them, um, and it's been a feature all that time. So I suspect the answer is, uh, is no. Yeah, so that, that to, to clarify your second question, is that not currently being applied to protected years? The forward rate of interest is only applicable to time to pay arrangements, so 4.25% is yeah. that it will be if you arrange a time to pay over five years, then that will be applicable to 4.25. That's not the retrospective rate of interest, which is applicable from the date the tax should have been paid according to the settlement. So that's a rate of 3.25% from, let's say 2010, when the loan was paid up until the point you settle, and then an increased 4.25% rate of forward interest from the date of settlement throughout the period of the time to pay. Hopefully that clarifies that. Great. Okay. Right. There's no other questions. So we will sh leave you all to go back and enjoy the rest of your work days. As always, there's our, our email address. If you have any other questions or we can help at all, please do just let us know. We're always ready to speak with you. And until the next webinar, thank you very much for attending. Thanks, guys.